Um, okay. Got it. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess uh, we'll start. It's 201. Uh, so welcome to my wildflower talk. Um, I am, I'm sorry, I can't see. Okay. Here we go. All right. So, um, oh, well, this is a Virginia Wildflowers of the Year talk. Um, thank you for coming. I'm Amy. I uh, am a mother of three. I'm a Virginia Master Naturalist. I'm also the vice president of the Virginia Master Naturalist Fancy Reeks chapter. Um, I love hiking. I am uh, always out there. I work at Fancy Reeks Nature Preserve. Um, where I'm the gardener. I grow food for the Loudoun Hunger Relief. All the food I grow at Banshee is um, donated to Loudoun Hunger Relief. And that is also where I instruct gardening classes. Um, I also volunteer a lot with Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy, as you can see right now. Um, I'm also on the Environmental Advisory Commission of Leesburg. That's uh, a commission that deals with um, basically advising the town of Leesburg's town council on any sort of environmental um, things. And um, also I have a degree in environmental management and a minor in natural sciences and I'm a houseplant and succulent collector and just general overall plant enthusiast. Love them all. Um, okay, so we're going to be going through all the wildflowers of Virginia and I love how the forest changes throughout the year. So as you can see in here, this is just the driveway to Banshee Reeks Na Nature Preserve. Um, the seasons bring all sorts of joy in, in really every month of it, a little less in February, but um, <laughs> so uh, we're going to just be going through all of them. I can't cover them all. These are just going to be, we're going to go through some of the spring ephemerals I covered last year in my spring ephemeral talk. Um, I'm going to be adding a few of those, going over a few of the ones from last year, and then we're going to look into just generally the, all the wildflowers that sort of replace the spring ephemerals throughout the year. So first let's talk about the uh, definition of ephemeral. Uh, ephemeral means it, it lasts for a very short time. Um, spring ephemerals refer to the first plants that emerge in the spring and they grow and bloom quickly and then they die back quickly. Um, there are, the word ephemeral is really subjective. Sometimes spring ephemerals will last three months but they're still considered a spring ephemeral. Um, whereas there's some later in the summer bloom, blooming plants that are pretty ephemeral. But I just wanted to put out the definition real quick because it's a term that we throw around a lot in the, in the flower world. Um, so first we have January. There's not much that grows in January. Um, as you can see here, this is a shot at Balls Bluff Regional Park where uh, there's just some mosses growing. You can find, if it gets warm enough, you can find some mushrooms, that's part of the fungal world. And then there is one flower that starts blooming in January and that's called the skunk cabbage. It's the first flower of the year to emerge. Uh, it smells like skunk, <laughs> it attracts flies and insects, I mean aquatic insects. Um, it's uh, thermogenic, it, that means it produces and it um, regulates its own heat. It can be, um, I think, 27 to 65 degrees warmer than the ambient temperature around the skunk cabbage. It um, is great at regulating its own heat and that way it sort of wafts up the smell of it, smells like skunk or a little bit like rotting flesh. Um, and that way it attracts flies. And flies are very, you know, house flies are pretty annoying, but they're actually a very essential pollinator um, and a decomposer when they're in um, larva form. Um, so they come out like looking like this in this, in January, February, they push out through the snow and ice. You'll find them in seepage areas where the water is still and clean. And um, they're just very interesting looking. And once they're done with the reproductive cycle, they push out these romaine lettuce looking heads. And then that supplies the, uh, some of the mammals in the dead of winter with some, some good food. Now in February, this is how the forest kind of looks usually. Um, not much growing here other than skunk cabbage. So we're gonna go ahead and skip ahead to March. <laughs> and this is how March usually looks too. It, it doesn't look 
great from afar, but as you can see here, we have skunk cabbage um, growing along the stream bank here. And you're gonna see a lot of other little things if you look hard enough. It, we have spring hepatica, spring beauties, harbinger of spring, and blood root. These are gonna be popping up through the, the, the brownness of the, the forest floor as March begins to get warmer. So spring hepaticas are one of the earliest bloomers. They can grow in a wide variety of soils. Um, they are really beautiful. The leaves stay out most of the year. They'll, they'll be evergreen, but the, the flowers are so quick and fleeting that I actually haven't seen them in person yet. I've had to find all these pictures from other people. Um, I found the leaves, but still have not seen the flower. Um, I'll try again this year, but they're so quick to bloom and then they're gone. We've got spring beauties. These are, to me, the, the true harbinger of spring, but we'll be getting through <clears throat> that flower that's called that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so it ranges in color from white to pink. This uh, it's sort of been investigated by scientists and how and why, but uh, it basically has to do with how uh, it'll attract bees. Um, Mammals do enjoy the corms. Uh, this, you'll find this almost everywhere in a good, healthy forest floor in late March. Um, as an adrenoid bee, does it be as its specialist pollinator? And, uh, and yes, again, it grows in moist woodlands. Um, I did cover some of these, so I have a lot of slides with a lot of really cool flower pictures. So we're kind of going to try to breeze through some of these. So. The harbinger of spring is one of the tiniest flowers. It's called the salt and pepper flower because the anthers, little red anthers turn black and they look like pepper. This is my wedding ring around one of them just to show how tiny they are. Their leaves um, are similar to carrot leaves. They're in the carrot family. Um, they're really a really cool sight to see. They're myrmecorcorus, which means the ants come and take the seeds and they're sort of just responsible for the, for the sowing of all the seeds of it. Um, and then after that, you'll see the cut leaf tooth war out there. It's part of the mustard family. Uh, it's very important. And the, it's, it's being kind of outcompeted at the moment by um, garlic mustard. It's the main threat to it because it is also a mustard and it's allelopathic and uh, can really crowd out these. But these are really interesting flower to see as well. They have crazy palmate uh, leaves at the base um, and the, the flowers don't, open if it's cloudy or rainy because it's trying to protect the uh, reproductive organs of the flower. Then, um, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat, but just to make sure nobody has questions. All right, so we have bloodroot. It is called this because it has a, an orange reddish um, uh, juice, as it were, that comes out of the root. Uh, it's very toxic, but it's a very gorgeous spring ephemeral. As you can see, it comes out first along with one leaf gently wrapped around the petal, then it blooms, and then very quickly dies off. So this, this will happen within a week or two. Um, so these are a, a really fleeting spring ephemeral. And later on, you'll just see the leaves in March, and then um, maybe in, I mean, in, in April, May. And um, these are self-pollinators, but they do enjoy it when they get some visitors from bees. Um, and this is the twin leaf just Jeffersonia. This one I still haven't seen bloom, but in this little picture here is the only picture I got of them last, last spring because I just missed the flower. So these will bloom around um, very late March, but they can be gone in an instant. I, took this on April 9th, so that's how quick they go. All right, we've got, uh, I put these two together on one slide because these are the two that confuse me sometimes. I'll see them throughout the year not in bloom and I will forget which one is which because their leaves come, uh, they stay they stay evergreen, well not evergreen, but they stay up throughout the year and actually saxifrage is pretty evergreen. Um, then uh, the plantain leaf pussy toes have they're a host plant for uh, the painted lady butterflies. Uh, very important spring bloomer. Um, and as you can see, both of them have fuzzy, maybe you can't see, um, they have fuzzy stems to uh, deter any ground beetles or ants from pollinating them. Many flowers have a specialist um, pollinator 
or a pollinator that they've evolved and adapted to sort of attract. So some plants will, um, will have a certain shape of flower to attract a different type of animal or insect. And then some of them will deter them by having fuzzy stems, any ground ones. And you'll see the patterns throughout this presentation and what sort of types of pollinators are attracted to each. Um, and these are the leaves of the saxifrage in December. I just saw those last month and I thought that was very interesting. Then um, we also have a lot of violets. We have four main violets that are native to Virginia. Um, we've got the common blue violet. This is the one you'll see most everywhere. Um, the creamy violet, it's, Beautiful and a little bit rare to see. Uh, you'll see that around um, uh, stream banks, um, open wetlands, things like that. Um, and then the smooth yellow violet is another beautiful one. I see it fairly commonly, but not as much as the common blue violet. And then there's the bird's foot violet that has leaves that are like bird's feet. And I still have not um, seen it myself. So thanks to Bill Kaur, another local botanist, I of that picture. All right, so we've got wildflowers in the trees. I have to excuse my dog from clicking around in the background. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of beautiful wildflowers in the trees throughout all of spring. I mean, almost every tree has a pretty cool flower, um, but I just wanted to show you a few of my favorites. Uh, in the very beginning of spring, you'll see the red maple and spice bush. Spice bush uh, is very ephemeral. The flowers are there for less than a week and then they move on to leafing out. Um, Eastern red bud usually starts uh, around late April. And um, then the, let's see, yeah, the dogwood and the tulip poplar and the southern catalpa are usually around May. Uh, dogwood might be April actually. Um, and uh, yeah, the uh, Virginia state wildflower is the American dogwood. Um, I'm hoping we change that because it is also North Carolina's state flower and just feel like we shouldn't repeat what they have and we have so many other cool flowers and it also has the word Florida in it. We're not Florida. <laughs> then uh, this is really a great representation of the forest in April. You got low uh, green growth along the forest floor. You've got uh, you know, the purple flowers from the Eastern redbud trees and then some uh, medium height foliage starting to really grow in. And you can sort of see the, the green and the leaves in the tops of the trees. So in April, we've got a lot of flowers, but also in the fumitory family, these are my favorite, I think, of all the spring wildflowers, the spring, spring ephemerals. Um, these just have the daintiest, prettiest leaves. They're similar to the carrot family leaves, but this is a different family. Um, these have just such interesting flowers. These ones are called um, Dutchman's breeches. They look like little pants hanging out to dry. Uh, we've got squirrel corn that look like little hearts. And these are also the other heart ones, fringe bleeding hearts. Um, you may have bleeding hearts in your garden. There's cultivars of the fringe bleeding hearts. Um, I have some bleeding hearts in my garden, but it is a cultivar. Um, still not bad, it's, it's still kind of a native. Um, and then back to the yellow fumor, there's a fringed variety of this that's less common in Virginia, but they're called scrambled eggs. And I just thought that was such a cool name. So whenever I see the yellow fumor, I call it scrambled eggs because it's just a, a more fun name. Um, so yes, you'll see these all along the forest floor growing, growing sort of above the floodplains where you'd see bluebells. Um, and, I just wanted to show you sort of how the forest floor looks at early April time of year. You've got just everywhere where it was, it was brown and just leaf covered through the winter is now just bursting in green life and flowers and excitement. Um, on the left, we have more of the squirrel corn. On the right, we have wild ginger flowers growing. We've got trout lilies um, and a few others like saxifrage and violets growing in this picture. Um, so trillium is a very interesting plant. Um, it is a Virginia native, of course. These can take over about six to eight years to mature uh, from, from plant to actual flower. Um, 
They have three leaves, three petals, six stamens. It's all about the three in the trillium world. That's why it's called trillium, the three. Um, the toad shade trillium has purple flowers and they are sicil, meaning they do not have the, uh, the calyx. And um, there is a type of beetle that pollinates them and they sort of have little parties inside of the little cups and that really helps pollinate it. Um, bees enjoy them as well and deer love to eat the whole plant. So when the deer are going, or when you see an area that's been really overgrazed by deer, you will find more trillium with these spotted looks on them. That's a camouflage that they've developed to sort of deter the deer. And you'll also find them being a lot more short if there's been deer present because they will just keep getting shorter and shorter to sort of hide from deer in future years. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got the yellow wake robin and the white wake, ro wake robin and toad shade that are native to Virginia. You'll see these a lot throughout Loudoun in the spring. So another fun one is wild ginger. Um, this is a weird looking flower. It, I feel like it looks like a demigorgon. <laughs> A little monster, but uh, it's, it's such a joy to find because you'll see these leaves everywhere and you don't see the flower. You have to lift up the leaves to look under. Um, as you can see, my hand is right there in this picture and they're a little furry and they're, they're this burgundy color and they did not evolve to be as attractive as other flowers because they have brown beetles and ants come to pollinate them. Um, they are also a host plant to the pipe vine butterfly but um, that's because it contains an acid that is similar to the pipevine plant that I'll get into later on in this. So trout lilies, another spring ephemeral favorite. They're just so gorgeous. You'll find areas that look like this among the floodplains um, near the bluebells in the spring, in early April, late March, and their leaves look like trout. They can be in yellow or in white. At Banshee Reeks, um, I've only seen the yellow trout lilies, but then at Balls Bluff, there are white and yellow trout lilies. They too do not open if they um, uh, if it's raining or cloudy. Uh, they'll only open if it's it's full sun. That way, that they know it's not going to get wet and waste their time and energy. Also, another uh, fun thing about trout lilies is that if there's only one leaf in one plant. Uh, then it will not flower this year. If it comes up with two leaves, it'll flower. And that's just so interesting. Um, so growing along the riverbanks, we've got Virginia bluebells. This is everybody's favorite, I think. Uh, they're just such a sight to see. Um, I wanted to spend a, a good moment on this. Um, bluebells come up looking like spinach at first, the green leaves, they bud out looking pink and purple and they're like cotton candy, then they bloom, they're blue for the most part. They can be pink um, and it's very rare, but they can be white as well. At Balls Bluff Regional Park, the, a lot of the bluebells are pink and they're just magnificent. Um, there's just, I guess they say that um, there's a bit of genetic variation that some people had hypothesized that it was the, the soil alkalinity or acidity, uh, de, you know, depending on the pH would, would indicate whether it's gonna be this color or that, but it actually turns out it's probably genetic and seeds from pink will become pink or who knows, maybe it's recessive, um, somebody knows. But yes, it is so wonderful to see them in pink too. And around Balls Bluff, and Bull Run and Banshee and many places that are just all along the floodplains of Loudoun, um, you're gonna see just huge swaths of them, just a sea of bluebells all along the floodplains in early April. I highly, highly recommend visiting any of your natural areas that have a, a river nearby it. Um, you'll see bluebells everywhere. It's, it's quite a sight in the spring. So along with um, all of these spring ephemerals is this rare guy called Jack in the Pulpit. Sometimes it's got a little bit more um, like a burgundy striping to it. This is the one I found last year. They're pretty rare. Sometimes you'll see the, the plant and not the flower. Later in the summer, the, the plant often stays up, but the flower dies down. Um, these 
it's called Jack in the Pulpit because this apparently looks like a pulpit and this looks like a person that's delivering a sermon. That's why it was named that. And um, it's sort of a, it's like an orchid in that it catches its, um, its prey or its pollinators and some of them make it out, some of them don't, but its main victims are thrips and, um, and fungal gnats, which I find interesting as a houseplant enthusiast that has to deal with fungal gnats and thrips sometimes. Their um, berries are red, all of it's toxic, don't, don't touch them, don't eat them, and never ever pick the flower. It's very rare, um, and they're just such an interesting forest flower. And then also we've got rue anemone. So anemone means god of wind, or it's, it's, it's also called the wind flower. These will blow in the breeze when there's no breeze blowing. Um, you see these just, just daintily floating in the wind. Um, they've got these adorable little mitten-like leaves. Um, they're just so cute, but also they, they bloom for a long time. They're not quite ephemeral in that um, definition. They, they bloom from about March through June and they're a great garden plant too. I'm sure a lot of you might have these growing in your garden. Then we've got bluettes. Bluettes are, I, I made sure to put up the pronunciation there because it can get confusing if you're just reading it. Um, so spring bluettes bloom in the spring around the same time as all the other ephemerals, early April. And you see these popping up all over fields um, at Falls Bluff Regional Park, they have them around the, the field near the cemetery. They just pop up everywhere. They're really adorable. Um, they're also called Quaker ladies. Then in the summer in June, there's a different set of bluettes that come up. They grow a little bit taller um, in order to outcompete the other uh, fast growing summer plants and the same sort of specialist pollinators. And then in July, you'll see these long leaf bluettes. I saw these, um, this picture is from when I went to the Blue Ridge Mountains in the summer in July. And um, yeah, they're a very interesting plant in the spring, the bluettes, the little bluettes. Um, we've also got dwarf larkspur. You're gonna see these around the trout lilies in mid-April. Uh, they bloom just after the, the trillium. Did I say trout lilies? Trillium. Um, they are pretty tall. I mean, they're called dwarf larkspur, but they grow about two, two three feet. Uh, you'll see these big, uh, purple flowers. They are pollinated by butterflies and some bees, um, and they're toxic to most mammals. Uh, hummingbirds like them as well. Really anything with long tongue, uh, so that includes butterflies, long-tongued bees, hummingbirds, they enjoy this. And if you get there too early, you're only going to see their leaves on the ground, and then these are pushed up about mid-April. This is a, in a a popular garden plant in order to attract black swallowtail butterflies. Um, it's called Golden Alexander. It's part of the carrot family. Um, the carrot family is a very interesting native one to me because this whole past year I've been trying to figure out which ones besides Zizia uh, were their host plants, the black swallowtail butterfly host plants, because oops, if you, um, if anybody you know grows herbs, you know that they love parsley, they love dill, and you'll find the the butter the caterpillars on your your herbs all summer, and they're wonderful. But I really was trying to seek out which native carrot family plants that these really had evolved with, because you know dill and parsley were brought here by Europeans. Um, but it's very important if you have a home garden and you want to have some natives, Golden Alexander is one of the ones you want to have because black swallowtail butterflies, unlike monarch butterflies, they overwinter as pupae here in the soil or underneath the leaves of these and or in the mulch. Um, it's very important for them to have something to lay their eggs on once they have hatched, or not hatched, when they come out of chrysalis form. And then they'll make um, a few generations throughout the summer and then go back into pupae form before the winter nearby something like Golden Alexander. So now we're getting into May. Um, this is how the forest to me looks in May. You see the leaves really growing in, uh, the forest floor is getting a little shadier, a lot more crowded, a lot more greens in May. It's, it's a beautiful time of year. Um, 
In May, we've got the Eastern Shooting Star. This is a picture I took last year when it was just too early in April for it, but it was just about to bloom. And this is a photo from wildflowers.org that I found that really truly depicts the beauty of the shooting star. You see how the, uh, the anthers and the, the whole flower parts are, are hanging down and the petals shoot backwards and showing an inflorescence sort of like a shooting star. Then these are some typical ones that you'll see in your garden in May that are all native. Um, you'll see these around sort of the same areas of like uh, woodland slopes, um, floodplains, deep forest and, and forest edges as well. Um, these are actually all native plants, but all of them were from my home garden where I have a lot of native plants growing. Um, you're gonna see this green and gold. It's a like a ground cover. I highly recommend this if you're looking for a ground cover for your garden in the summer, but you'll find this in areas where you'd find um, lesser celandine or um, which is an, an invasive uh, floodplains like um, where bluebells are. And then woodland flocks, you're gonna see a lot of that throughout the, the, the speckled shade of the woods. We do have our own native iris. A lot of people just plant um, many different varieties of irises in their home gardens, but the Virginia blue flag iris is one of our, um, one of our only irises that are uh, native. And um, then heartleaf foam flower has a lot of different specialist pollinators and a lot of different um, um, uh, insects that have evolved to live off of it and feed from it. Um, and then we've got the wild columbine. This is our only native wild columbine um, in Virginia. It's, it's gorgeous too, similar to the shooting star. It sort of looks like a shooting star. It looks like it's sort of backwards growing its petals. Um, it's, it's a real joy to see in the, in the wild. Um, yes, May is usually when you, you know, your garden is like really in full bloom. It's when you want to put out your tomatoes. It's when you want to put out your peppers. And um, that's really when like the garden really starts. So I just wanted to show the garden plants that are native that you could also plant in your garden or also find out in the wild. Um, and also in May, we have May apples. You'll see the plants of these starting to develop in late March, early April, but they'll go into bloom in May. Uh, they have two umbrella-like leaves per plant, I guess, and then one flower underneath the two leaves of um, and that it's just so beautiful. The, the leaves serve as an umbrella. They really enjoy a moist, shady uh, forest edges. You'd see this along um, driveways sometimes next to a forest. Um, and then it does bear a fruit called the May apple, and that's usually ripe around August, September, but I would not recommend eating it. Can be cooked to be not toxic, but just I don't recommend you eating any of the plants I have in this presentation as to not have liability. <laughs> um, it is in the barberry family, which I found very interesting. It's the very vast and strange family, the barberries. Um, again, they're, they're, they bloom in May. Um, this is another plant I wanted to sort of go through with everybody just to show while you're looking for the spring ephemerals, you're gonna see this strange looking plant right here. Um, it has similar leaves to a uh, meadow rue. It's got blue stems at, in the beginning of the year or in, in the spring and they're, they're powdery, they have a farina coating on them, similar to like a succulent, a powdery succulent. Um, and then the flowers are, are, they're cute, but I just wanted to point it out to you because when I'm on wildflower walks, this is always there. And I just wanted to introduce blue cohosh as it should be introduced. Um, it does, you know, it is technically a spring wildflower as a flower. And then later on in the summer, you're gonna see this covering the forest floor in certain areas. Um, they're about a foot high, maybe a foot and a half. Um, and you're just gonna see a sea of them everywhere. So uh, hopefully you will know that this is blue cohosh. And they have these little blueberries, that's toxic. Don't eat that. Um, and it's also part of the barberry family, similar to May apples. And I wanted to briefly go over the azaleas and rhododendrons of Virginia. Um, Virginia apparently has the highest concentration, Virginia and North Carolina have the highest concentration of rhododendrons in the country. Um, 
that um, there's over a thousand species of, of rhododendron. Ninety percent of them are in um, in Asia, and some of them are, are on the west coast of North America, Canada, United States. Um, but Virginia and North Carolina is the highest concentration of heath member heath family members. Heath family is it includes azaleas, rhododendrons, blueberries, and uh, mountain laurel. So. One thing I wanted to point out is that all azaleas are rhododendrons, but not all rhododendrons are azaleas. Um, uh, these are some of our, our main native ones. There's cultivars of every, every kind of rhododendron and azalea. I don't wanna get into all of them, but I just wanted to show you a few of the native ones. The great rhododendron is the West Virginia state flower. This one uh, goes from West Virginia up to Maine all along Appalachia. And then the Catawba rhododendron goes from West Virginia down to Alabama along the Appalachians. Um, then the flame azalea is a wonderful um, garden plant and it just has the most gorgeous flowers in my opinion. I really like orange or yellow. Um, but yes, rhododendrons usually have bigger, thicker leaves. Um, they have a slightly different um, way that they display the flowers, but it really, it, you start getting lost between the differences in azalea and rhododendrons. So just, you can just call them all rhododendron, you'll be safe. So uh, as I had mentioned, mountain laurel is another part of the, the heath family. Uh, they had the most interesting flowers of shrubs. They start off looking like little, little paper lanterns, paper balloons, and then they pop open to these gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. And I love the leaves. Um, you'll see mountain laurel covering all over the mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, they love, you know, acidic soils that are dry. They can tolerate a lot. They're they're pretty much evergreen for the most part. Um, they're you'll find them everywhere. But I would highly encourage you go hiking in May, anywhere in the mountains, and you'll see a ton of blooming um, mountain laurel. All right, now we are at June. I took this picture at state. Uh, the, at, what is it? Sky Meadows State Park. Um, we got here is in the foreground uh, the prairie with different types of um, the starts of some spring, I mean, some late spring, early summer flowers. And then we got um, red bud, a line of red bud trees here in the, in the middle, and then uh, the forest in the background. Um, June is a great time of year when so many plants are blooming. You got it's, it's fully summer, it's a great time of year. Um, a big flower you're going to see around is uh, Monarda, uh, bee balm it's also called. This is the most common uh, bee balm we have. It's um, uh, the wild bergamot. It's called bergamot because it apparently looked like um, the, the bergamot orange when it was first discovered and um, Monarda is named after the, I believe, the Spanish um, botanist that um, he didn't discover them. He never made it to North America, but he was what it was named after. Uh, he really enjoyed the mint family, apparently. Um, this year, I saw white bergamot in the woods for the first time. It was really wonderful, um, but honestly, I can see why it's not a popular garden plant and why I kind of don't see it because the flowers are not as pretty. They, they get just like brown and, and dead looking pretty fast. Um, they're not the most attractive of all the Monarda bee balms. Um, then uh, these are our four main native um, bee balms, just to let you know if I didn't say that earlier. Um, and then we've also got horse mint. I still haven't seen that, but I would love to. It looks gorgeous. Um, then we've got the scarlet bee balm. Now this is a very important flower. Uh, butterflies, hummingbirds, bees, they love bee balm, um, hence the name. Now they're all part of the mint family. All mint family flowers have a square stem. And if you feel it, it'll, it'll feel four sides on each one. If you're not sure if something is part of the mint family, you could feel the stem, but be careful. Um, they don't hurt or anything, but there are some plants that do hurt if you touch them. I'll get into that later. Um, so we're gonna get into the botany of bee balm. Let me just show you here. So we've got the, the calyx here, and this is sort of the, the plant part that holds up the flower petals and the rest of the reproductive organs. Um, and with bee balm, they start at the very center of the calyx at the top, and then 
those will die off once they've been pollinated. And um, then there's a, it'll, it'll grow sort of a bald spot in the middle, making it uh, more of a, a daisy look to it. Um, as you can see, anything with a long tongue would love to pollinate this. So that's why it's loved by um, hummingbirds, butterflies, long tongue bees. They have opposite leaves. They have a square stem. Their bracts are a bit um, more of a, like a purple tinge to them. And this year, when I was in the mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains, I saw scarlet bee balm growing in the middle of the forest. And it was just the most amazing sight because I, I have a bunch of this in my garden at home. It's one of my favorite flowers. And just to see this huge patch of it in the middle of the woods is just like, it was amazing. <laughs> so I just needed to share that. And then we've got some weird flowers. <clears throat> so really throughout the year, you can, you can see these, especially the ghost pipes popping up pretty much any time of year if it's warm enough. Um, I wasn't really sure what part of the calendar to put these on because you're gonna see these cancer root ones throughout the year, but they flower, I'd say midsummer. Um, the ghost pipes are saprophytic. Both of them are um, actually, so they've abandoned photosynthesis completely. The ghost pipes is a plant. It looks like a fungus, but it, it is a flower and it lives off of the fungal network in the ground underneath the trees. It doesn't, it's not parasitic to any other plants, but it is parasitic to fungus, but it's a mutual relationship where, you know, it ebbs and flows and it reaches an equilibrium thanks to these guys. So you're gonna see them popping up really any time of the temperate year, um, but they have very short bloom time, about a week or two, and you're not gonna see these anymore. So if you do see them, take a picture because they are really, really cool. Um, then with American cancer root, you're going to see these popping up um, in, in March, April, and they're going to look like little pine cones. And they are, they are plants. They, are, they have flowery reproductive organs, but they have also abandoned photosynthesis. They're saprophytic. They, use, um, they are parasitic, and they use the, the roots of oak trees to, to give them energy. Therefore, they're a parasite to them, but they're also a a part of the forest floor ecosystem. Um, and yes, it, it flowers in May or June. And they, they sort of look like this, not the prettiest thing, but you'll see this everywhere around Balls Bluff in the spring and summer. And you're gonna say, what are these pine cones? So that's what they are. <laughs> then uh, we have these aerostolic acid plants. These are super weird plants that are all the same family. Um, they all produce the same, um, acid that makes the pipe vine swallowtail toxic to predators. So they lay, they lay their eggs on the plants, their larvae, their caterpillars eat the plants, then they become more toxic, and then they become butterflies, and they move on and they keep looking for plants with the aerostolic acid. Um, now you're going to see these have the same similar coloring and weirdness and demigorganness as um, wild ginger. So I just wanted to Slip that one back in there, remind you, this is a very common theme throughout them. Um, this is technically a different genus, but it's part of the same family, wild ginger. Um, it's very weird looking plants, but uh, I, I now have a Dutchman's pipe vine growing in my backyard. I planted it last year. Um, <clears throat> so we've got milkweed. Milkweed is a huge part of our ecosystem in the summer. You're gonna see them in fields, um, in uh, you know, definitely school gardens, other, you know, home gardens. Um, they are very important to the monarch butterflies. They are the only host plant. Um, these are our three varieties of Virginia um, milkweed in our, in our region of, of the sort of Piedmont or Latin area. Um, around the, the tidewater area, there's a few other types of milkweed that are a bit sharper looking. They look more like pokeweed. Um, and then in the more Western or Valley and Ridge areas, there's a couple other species, but these are our main three species of milkweed. Uh, butterfly weed is my favorite one because it's low growing and it just looks neat and pretty and I like orange flowers. Um, and uh, com uh, swamp milkweed is um, a very tidy and, and good looking one, but it does enjoy to have uh, some wet feet. So if you have a dry garden and you want to have something taller, go for the common milkweed. Um, and yes, if you have ever grown milkweed, you know, the process of the, the 
monarch caterpillars, oops, caterpillars, um, you know, they lay the eggs here, then the caterpillars come out of the eggs and they, you know, eat through the whole plant, they'll go through, they'll eat every part of the plant if they can, um, the flower, the, the pods, everything, and then they'll you know, become a, a pupated, turn into a chrysalis and then come out as a monarch butterfly. Now it is July. So this is a representation of what the forest floor looks like in July. Um, we've got a lot of um, stinging nettle here. You see the forest floor is very shaded. The spring ephemerals are gone. They needed to do their thing, reproduce and get out before um, um, they, sorry, I just noticed my dog and husband in this picture. <laughs> um, yeah, so the ephemerals are done. They need to be done before the leaves all get uh, fully grown in and the, and the shade comes in in the forest. So as I just mentioned, you'll see stinging nettle all over the forest floor in the summer. Um, if you've ever experienced it, you know what it's like. It's, it, it hurts. Um, I just wanted to sort of differentiate the difference between what you would hear a stinging nettle and then you hear wood nettle, which one's which, which one's good, which one's bad. You'd think maybe this is bad because it's, it's everywhere, but it's actually the native one. It's good, it just hurts. Um, you might also see stinging nettle in the spring that looks like this. They're a little bit daintier and shinier um, when they first emerge. You can make teas from either one um, as long as they're the fresh young leaves. Um, they're not as painful when they first emerge in the spring, but they are very painful later on. If you just brush past them, you'll feel the barbs hit your leg or wherever you touch them with, and it hurts a lot. Um, but there is a remedy around in the forest called jewelweed that will help you through it. But I just wanted to quickly go over how um, strange the flowers look in, in all the nettles. They are not pretty because they're wind pollinated. When flowers are wind pollinated, they do not need to look pretty. They don't need to do anything special except be able to release their pollen whenever there's a breeze. So uh, whenever you see strange looking flowers like these, just know uh, whatever that is, is wind pollinated. Similar to ragweed, ragweed is wind pollinated and that is what makes people have really bad allergies in the, in the fall. So as I uh, was talking about jewelweed, you'll find jewelweed growing in most places that you'd find stinging nettle. You'll also find poison ivy nearby this because they all grow in similar areas where it's um, a bit wetter shadier. Um, you can find these on forest edges too. They don't mind some full sun, but they love wet feet. So you'll find them near a stream in the forest. So uh, if you see jewelweed, you'll probably see poison ivy, or if you see jewelweed, you'll probably see stinging nettle. And if you get stung by stinging nettle, look for the jewelweed leaves, because if you crush them up, they um, have this oil in them that relieves any sort of stinging from the stinging nettle. Um, it also is good for, for poison ivy. Um, just poison ivy is a little bit different because stinging nettle will leave these barbs in you that you can just, it, it's relieved by just like sort of brushing off. Whereas poison ivy, the oils is what caused the rash. So sometimes, I mean, I wouldn't recommend right away putting pale, I mean, jewelweed flowers on, on your poison ivy because it, it could just spread it further, but it will, it can relieve the itch from poison ivy. Um, but if you do get stung by stinging nettle, I would suggest taking any one of these leaves, crushing them up in your fingers, and then taking that oil and spreading it where it hits you. Um, it goes away almost immediately. It's, it's wonderful. Um, in the summer, I went and saw, uh, I saw the pale jewelweed, which I had never seen around here. Um, it's rarer to be, to see around the Loudoun area, but um, I found it in the, the Appalachian Mountains, Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, but it is a cousin of it, it's related, and you can find it here. I just thought it was interesting. Um, also, these are, they self-pollinate and they're legumes. They're just this wonderful um, plant of the forest. They are called touch me not only because their seed pods fly at you and they can shoot past you like 30 feet away and apparently they can get you in the eye, but I don't like the name touch me not because I wanna touch these and they'll find a touch. <laughs> And then we've got the Turk's cap lily, the best lily, in my opinion. It is the largest native lily of Virginia. Um, it's beautiful, it's rare. I had the honor of seeing it when I was in the Blue Ridge Mountains this summer. Um, I just love lilies and I loved finding that 
these were a native lily and not one of the you know tiger lilies or day lilies or other types of lilies you see everywhere on roadsides or in people's gardens. Um, and these are on the endangered list. Please never pick them. Please never do anything but take a picture of them. Um, this year I discovered purple flowered raspberry. I had never heard of them before till I stumbled upon them. And I just wanted to show them to you because, you know, we're all used to seeing raspberries and blackberries and, and wine berries. The wine berries are invasive, um, but we never usually see these anywhere. So I, I just wanted to show them off to you. They're called thimbleberry also because they look like little thimbles as, as the flowers, um, the petals fall off and after the berries have ripened. Um, they're apparently not very tasty. Um, there's a very interesting plant, huge leaves and they can create kind of big masses, but they're, they're enjoyed by different types of wildlife. They have a place, they're definitely a very interesting plant. Then there's some other flowers in July. I can't cover everything, but I just wanted to show you some of these. Um, the starry campion is um, just a fun little one that looks like carnations. It's related to carnations. It's got sort of um, fringed feathered leaves. Um, you'll find these on forest edges. Um, then the yellow fa false foxglove was an interesting one to find. The flower blooms and it and it sort of dies, looks like this so quickly. It can look you know, like a bud and then this within a day. But these are actually partial plant parasites. They still photosynthesize, but they um, feed off, their roots feed off of other plants as well. So they do both of the, the parasitizing and photosynthesizing. Um, and then we've got tall bellflowers. I ran into some of these in the forest in, in July. Um, there's a very interesting um, bellflower, uh, very pretty uh, lavender colored bluish petals and they're, they're loved by hummingbirds and butterflies and they're, they go around streams along with other types of bellflowers. And then we are in August. We're doing okay on time. Um, so this is a shot I took off of a pond uh, just across the river in Maryland. Um, I just thought this is a perfect depiction of August because we've got um, all these different iron weeds and Joe pie weeds and swamp mallows. Um, and so these are the swamp rose mallows. This is our native hibiscus. Um, hibiscus is actually a Greek word for mallow. So it's you know, in the mallow family. It, it looks like it's tropical, not supposed to be here, but it is, it's native and it's a wonderful plant enjoyed by many a pollinator. They've got just huge flowers. You'll find these along ponds, lakes, uh, forest edges, fields, um, anywhere where there's full sun. Um, they're, they're just a gorgeous August plant. Then we've got closed bottle gentians. Um, these right here on the right are ones that are growing in my home garden. Um, when I got them, I had no idea what gentians were, let alone closed bottles. So my first year I had them, um, I was wondering when they were gonna bloom. Turns out this is them in full bloom. They never actually open. It takes a very strong bee to open them. Um, it's definitely a very interesting specialist plant for a specialist pollinator. Um, this is the wild version of it on the left. I still haven't seen it in the wild, but I will be very excited when I do. <laughs> Um, yeah, it just takes a very, a, a strong bumblebee to really pry the petals open and get inside and pollinate it. Um, so then we've got sunflower like summer flowers. Now this, these are such a frustrating group of flowers as a plant enthusiast because they all kind of look the same. I mean, you can see slight differences in all of them, but can you really remember the identifications for each? No. Um, these are yellow composite flowers, all part of the aster family. Um, they just call them all sunflowers, it's fine, except the black eyed seasons. That one's the state flower of Maryland. Proud of that one from my Maryland heritage, but um, it's the one you can definitely tell apart from all of them because of the little uh, black calyx in the middle. Um, so, yeah, we've got Biden's as a, a genera of, of flowers, like. Um, uh, beggar ticks are in there. They're, um, they're so similar to sunflowers, but again, they're not. We've got false sunflower, also called oxeye sunflower. It's, that's a heliopsis, helianthioids, while woodland flower is helianthus divercatus. It's, it, 
it's all a wash. They're just, just calling the sunflower, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so then we've got lobelias. Uh, so a, an interesting um, fact about Virginia, we only have three true red blooming flowers that are native um, and cardinal flower is one of them. Scarlet bee balm was the other. And then I believe it's the wild columbine that's the other. Don't quote me on that. Um, so yes, you can find these along streams. Um, they have gorgeous open flowers where it's sort of got only petals on one side, similar to the bell flower. And you can see it's just sort of welcoming the pollinators to come to it. Hummingbirds are a big fan, um, butterflies, um, long-tongued pollinators like those. Um, I found these next to a stream in the summer. Uh, they're gorgeous. They can be just like uh, how bluebells are with the pink and the purple and the blue. It's just, it's just a gorgeous flower. I can't really decide which one I like more. So they're both there. Then we are in September. This is my garden at Banshee. Um, I let a lot of wildflowers kind of go rogue this summer over my strawberry patch. Um, and I have a lot of native um, wildflowers in my other flower patch, but somehow I did not get a lot of photos of them this year, but I thought this was a great shot of, you see goldenrod, you see aster or boneset um, and a blue mist flower along with the sunflowers I planted and the squash. It's a great shot of September. Um, so, Throughout August and September, uh, you're gonna see iron weeds everywhere. Um, there's a few different types. They have slightly different genuses, but they're all sort of considered part of the iron weed group. Um, they have very specialist pollen, uh, like um, I guess pollinators, insects that live off of them. Um, they all have their own type of moths that need them, butterflies that need them. This is the, um, September is really sort of the last rush of, of life before the dead of winter. So you've got no more spring ephemerals, but all these animals and insects are still out. So they need to find other types of specialist things to get to. So we've got um, Joe pie weed, sweet Joe pie weed, New York ironweed, wing stem. Um, I've never actually heard it called yellow ironweed, but I was happy to see that because they always are so much, they were so much like to me. Wing stem is called wing stem because um, you can kind of see in the picture, each stem has these sort of flaps that come off it like wings. Um, so if you're wondering what this weed looking plant is that's growing tall in your garden and it's not doing anything and it's August and it still won't do anything, um, it will bloom soon and it is a wing stem and it's a very important um, plant for a few types of butterflies and moths, as well as the Joe pie weeds. Um, you see them here in pink or in sweet Joe pie weed, they're, they're white and a little bit smaller. Um, they all have sort of the similar theme of the type of leaves, the type of stemming, the type of um, uh, a bloom really of them all um, and inflorescence of each flower head. So September, October is also the time for goldenrod. Now, goldenrod, there are so many types of goldenrod. Um, I think there are 25 species of goldenrod in just our Northern Virginia area. Um, and I can't even begin to try to identify each and every one of these. I mean, I can kind of, there's uh, the tall goldenrod, uh, Altissima, Slodago Altissima. We've got, um, I think that's Canada goldenrod. We've got uh, Eupatorium, um, early goldenrod. But it, anyway, it, there's just so many types of goldenrod that, as you can see here, it's just too much. But that's what you'll see all over the fields in September, October, just bright yellow everywhere. Um, and uh, then after that, we've got the asters. Uh, October, September, October, huge aster times. Um, you're still gonna see asters blooming all through November and December um, until it gets way too cold. Asters are so important. Um, any given aster can support any given aster plant can support over 122 uh, types of caterpillars and moths and butterflies. Um, there's, there's a, this is the main genus. When I'm talking about, when I'm talking about asters, it's more the Sympotrichium, with the tricky flowers of the fall. Um, 
there's just so many different types. And I'm gonna do the same thing I did with the goldenrod slide where there's just, there's, it's, there's so many asters out there. So any sort of daisy-like shape is what I, most people just consider an aster. So you're pretty safe to say if you're out on a hike and you see these types of flowers that look like daisy, just call them an aster and you'll sound like a pro. Um, I love these little calico asters here. So um, I just wanna also mention that asters are composite flowers, same with all the, the sunflowers that I showed you that are blooming through the summer. Um, and this means that what is what we think is the middle of the flower is actually hundreds of flowers on a sunflower's case, um, where each and every little spot here is a different flower. So a sunflower like this will have you know, 100, 200 different flowers in it. And then these petals are actually just the ray florets. Um, the disc florette will have the whole reproductive organ in it. And then each seed will come out of each flower. And then you know what sunflower seeds are like. This is the same for all the asters. So if you see, they all have some million little tiny composite flowers and then the disc florette, I mean, the ray florette all the way around it. Um, so now we're in October. This is how the forest looks in October. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, these are also part of the aster family, the bonisets. They uh, are just, just wonderful, like, I don't know, puffs of joy, I feel like, um, throughout the, they, these all bloom. I mean, blue mist flower is more like an August, September, October type of plant and late bonnet is more September, October, November, um, but they're related. They're all part of the aster family, but they're in the same genus. Um, sometimes they're, they have different genuses listed elsewhere, but they're, they're related close enough. Um, the blue mist flower is just a gorgeous one with a lot of different, um, Pollinator specialist, same with that one. You can see we'll be on that. Um, then we've got evening primrose. This is a, a great October bloomer. Um, they can get quite tall. There's a lot of confusion about which primroses are the native ones. This is one of them. Um, there's not many because they've just been cultivated throughout all human history and they, they, they really cross, cross pollinate pretty easily. But, and they look like a weed or like, like fire weed here. And then they bloom these beautiful bells of of yellow flowers in October. Now we've got a few berries in autumn I wanted to point out. Um, American dogwood that I mentioned earlier is has these, these red berries, um, coral berry honeysuckle. This is like the only time of year you can really differentiate the difference in honeysuckles, which is uh, you know, in, in late autumn, you'll see these really pretty berries. And this, it's really interesting, the whole native honeysuckle genera um, and how they're different from the, the invasive honeysuckle. Um, but then there's also the aromatic sumac. These berries are, are edible. I had this past summer, I foraged for them and I, and I dried them and then I made them into um, lemonade that there's a, uh, an acid on it that's similar to citric acid. It's sort of an M, malic acid. And it, it's so sour and delicious. And a lot of people think sumac is poisonous. Poison sumac is actually barely around the area. So most of the time you see sumac, it's not poisonous. It's not, um, it's not gonna hurt you like poison ivy would. And um, there's a few varieties, but when you see these, these are called droops. They're not really berries. I just wanted to sort of add them in here because you're gonna see a lot of this gorgeous red foliage in the autumn and then the berries drooping down. Um, and then American beauty berry is a gorgeous, burying plant in the fall. It looks like this before the leaves fall, the leaves come off and then it's still got the purple berries. It's so gorgeous. It's, it's great for birds. Um, there's a lot of other ones that bury in autumn, but we don't have all the time in the world. So these are the, the main four I'm discussing today. Then we're in November. This is a shot I took at Balls Bluff Regional Park. Um, this is a great time of year to identify all the oaks that you can. I, I did a whole oak exploration here that day in November. Um, in November, we've got the latest blooming flower of all plants native to Virginia. Um, it's witch hazel. So witch hazel actually keeps its seeds on in these sort of clusters um, all year long. And then it fruits, I mean, it, it flowers in November, maybe December in some areas and has these strange petals that come out of it. And by that time, they're ready to pop out the seeds of last year's flower. 
So they, they're pollinated in November, then it takes a full year for them to shoot out from the seed pod and land on the forest floor. And it takes about one to two years to germinate these seeds. And then um, uh, this is also why it's called like a snapping stick, snapping tree, um, because apparently the, the seed pods really like shoot out at you like a few other types. Um, and they are self-pollinated, which also makes sense because there's not really any pollinators around in November. It's a very interesting plan, how, how it evolved just doing it itself. Um, it's just a wonder of nature. Uh, this is how the plant looks in the in in the summer. You got the leaves, and you got the the bits of the seeds still there. They're very tiny, and then once the whole plant, when once all the leaves turn yellow, you're going to see the yellow flowers, too. And um, then we've just got December. There's actually nothing else other than witch hazel blooming in December. Um, in December, I highly encourage you to. When, when you're looking through the forest and you feel like it looks bleak, look for the sycamores around water or when you're driving, you'll notice, oh, there must be water over there because you see a whole bunch of white branches coming off the trees. These are sycamores. Um, try to look out for them everywhere you can because it makes December a lot brighter. And then um, thank you for joining this wildflower talk. Um, wow, sorry, I went over in time, but I now can take some questions. Oops. All right, so let's see here. Does anybody have any questions? Let me look through the chat a little bit. Somebody has jewelry growing and seeing it all. Okay. Little discussion about the, uh, the uh, tricky mountain laurel. Wondered if you had any experience with that. Um, growing laurel, I yeah. have. I do have my own um, mountain laurel plant, but it's it's a cultivar I got before I got into native plants. It's um, I've been able to move it three times and it's still doing great. Um, I just needed to keep water on it, and it, it likes it likes the front of my house, which is north facing in the shade. Um, it's bloomed every year. Um, it does like acid soil, that's true. That is something you should monitor if you have, uh, because a lot of potting soil or, or soil mixes are very, um, sorry, pH of about eight. So yeah, they do like it, um, pretty acidic. And yeah, mountain laurels, it can be tricky, I guess, because it's just one of those native plants that just sort of happen all along the mountains um, in dry, acidic areas. So it's sort of one of those things where they just grow where they wanna grow. Um, I'm sure there's cultivars that have a lot more um, the, uh, specialization for, for getting um, established. Um, an evergreen bush that will grow next to a ditch with water. Uh, Holly, Holly will tolerate some water. Um, what do you think, BJ? You also worked at Watermark Woods. <laughs> uh, it's, it's oh, Amazon. Aromatic. Oh, what did you say? I was thinking aromatic sumac, but it's not much of a shrub. I mean, it kind of is. It's not very big. It didn't get very big. Um, oh, there's some more questions here. Oh, somebody's rhododendrons were all eaten by the deer. <laughs> and yes, goldenrod can be medicinal for tea. I try not to recommend anything as medicinal um, in my talks because I don't want to be held responsible for anybody getting poisoned. <laughs> oh, bayberry is a good one too um, for for a shrub. It's good for a ditch. Um, oh, I yeah, I would love to. Do a Zoom lesson with kids. I also teach um, gardening classes. Oh, this is a direct message. I guess we can't see that. Somebody asked if I could do um, some Zoom lessons with students, and um, yes, I can do that. I also um, teach some. We'll be teaching some gardening classes this year at Banshee to kids and adults. Um, and 
Does anybody have any other questions? Oh, I see Sally asked which milkweed is best uh, to plant in a small yard that doesn't spread too much. Okay, um, I prefer uh, uh, tuberosa. I always forget the butterfly weed, the common name. Um, it's I like how low growing it is and it doesn't get out of hand. It can, I did have it in a, in a vegetable bed at first and I had, to, I had to rip it out for a few years in a row and keep um, moving it. Um, they don't love to be moved, but as long as you have enough water on them, they can live. Um, but swamp milkweed is a, a pretty one that if you have, if it's not too dry and full sun, then swamp milkweed's a good one. And it's nicer and daintier. Um, common milkweed can get really overrun by aphids and flies. Once the aphids get to it, they start secreting the, um, the the sap from it, and that's when you see the milkweed leaves are covered in like a black covering, and um, that's when the wasps and the flies all start going for it because they want that sweet um, sap also, and then it just becomes this huge mess. So if you see aphids on your milkweed, blast them all off with some uh, a wa like a hose. Uh, just water will get them off, um, and if it's really bad, then just cut it all the way. Uh, down to like maybe this high off the ground and it'll shoot back up some new leaves before the monarch butterflies need them. Um, oh, and where is Banshee? It's actually off of Evergreen Mills by the uh, the landfill uh, in right in the outskirts of Leesburg. It's still technically Leesburg. Um, oh, I guess I should have put my email for contact. Um, let me put that here. Um, I'm Amy Mason, 22. I will send out a wrap up email to everybody soon too, so we can put it on there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about um, growing bluebells. Any tips on growing bluebells? Um, I actually have not grown them myself. Um, just know that they need uh, some shade, uh, but also know that they are fleeting once they're up. You got maybe a couple weeks and then they're gonna disappear. So don't feel like you killed it. It might still come back next year. Um, bluebells are pollinated by many different uh, bees and, and butterflies, but um, they usually spread by rhizomes. So if you divide them while they're up and you know where they are, you can divide them and split them and, and replant them um, and they could be okay. And then um, otherwise they're usually spread by when it floods. And that's why you see them around all those streams and, and rivers is because they're, they they get flooded through and washed into the, the stream and then redistributed on the stream ba stream banks. Um, so it's one of those wild ones. I haven't grown myself. Um, I'd like to, but I, I am a little scared. <laughs> and um, uh, the, the Leesburg Committee. Yes, yeah, so I'm part of the Leesburg Environmental Advisory Commission um, now. I, I'm a, an elected town official where we, um, we help the town council make decisions um, about the environment. It doesn't mean they'll always listen to us, but we have we make advice, um, recommendations, and we're also in charge of the Leesburg Flower and Garden Festival, so that's cool. <laughs> and let me see any other questions. Recommendations for seeds for wildflowers? Um, um, I would, make sure that you're getting stuff that is from a reputable um, wildflower site that specializes in wildflowers. Um, uh, there's also Watermark Woods is my favorite local nursery that they specialize in native plants only. Um, and I just love all of her products, all of her plants. They, they I, I have a lot of native plants in my own garden and I planted different um, native gardens around town at um, Frederick Douglass Elementary and then at, my, at Banshee and all of their nurseries. Uh, yeah, Watermark Woods is what I said. Um, Julie is the owner and she's amazing too. And uh, it's over in Hamilton. It's, it's not too far from Leesburg. Um, it's a great place to get some native plants. It's my personal favorite. But she just knows everything about all the native plants as well. Um, uh, then, good, good resources to keep learning about wildflowers. Ooh, um, I, oh, there's a, well, the Virginia Native Plant Society is a wonderful organization that specializes in Virginia native plants. You can become a member. Um, I believe it's like 30 a year. Um, and then you can get invited to all these different uh, online or in-person events. And they have a lot of resources. 
Um, let me write down the Virginia Native Plants Society. Oh, let's put some of those um, links down on our wrap up email too, because I have some ideas also. Okay, yeah. And um, yeah, there's also the, the Piedmont environmental and then um, and plant the Nova Natives. Oh, plant Nova Natives. And there's um, uh, wildflowers.org is, is a really good research site if you're looking for more information. Um, they, they touch lightly on the really specifics of each type of plant. Um, and I wish I could cover more flowers, but eh, there's just so many to choose from. <laughs> and there any other questions? Yeah, okay, just reiterating Watermark Woods, that's in Hamilton, Virginia, if you're local. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I'll be sending out the PowerPoint um, to Loud Wildlife, to BJ, and, and everybody can have access to it. And um, yes, and if uh, you'd like to help out, uh, you can donate to Loud Wildlife Conservancy by being a member. Um, you can also donate to uh, Banshee Reeks, Friends of Banshee Reeks. Um, that's our nonprofit organization that supports us. And then, um, if you really want to pursue this more, uh, you can become a Virginia, Virginia Master Naturalist. Um, I'm also the membership chair for it, <laughs> as well as vice president. And oh, oh BJ, you, is there going to be a seed swap? Um, it's uh, it's going to be um, a little seed library in Hamilton, in my front porch. <laughs> oh, cool! <laughs> I, I am not there a lot, but uh, I'm going to. I'll advertise to those that are interested who want to come by and pick up a selection of seeds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And somebody else said that Watermark Woods closes during the winter. Yeah. A lot of um, nurseries, unfortunately, are closed usually until about March or April. Um, uh, with Watermark Woods, though, she does take appointments. You can order things, uh, see if she has them now. And, um, she can talk to you about um, picking them up during her off season hours. Um, oh, State Arboretum has a, a seed exchange next weekend, apparently. Great. Um, um, a kid section for junior naturalists. Um, I'm not sure about with uh, Lawn Wildlife, but at Banshee Rakes, we're, we're doing a little program where you can come pick up like a packet and, and do all these different activities. Um, for the junior naturalist sort of achievement level and come and get a prize when you're done with all the packets. Um, it's a fun little exercise for, for kids that want to be naturalists at Banshee. Oh, let's put that in the wrap up email too. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the scout badges for things they learn. Yeah. Uh, and we do offer now a lot more um, options for um, scout badges at Banshee Reeks. Just uh, we'll put that in the wrap up email as well. Um, and well, I'll also be doing a bunch of wildflower walks um, with Loudon Wildlife and through Banshee Reeks um, at, at both Banshee Reeks and I'm not sure if I'm doing a Balls Bluff wildflower walk, but I really want to because they have a lot of wildflowers. Um, the Banshee Reeks activities, uh, well, for the junior naturalist thing, it's, it's, it's aimed towards children, um, but then uh, I have a gardening class at Banshee Reeks that's ages five to 12. And then um, the, there's, I have um, adult gardening classes are really like age six, 15, 16 and up for gardening classes um, as well. And then, okay, Janine put in the native plant cell link in the comments. It's a little later than usual because of scheduling problems with Morgan Park, but that is the date, April 16th. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, I do not do wildflower walks in Alexandria, DC, but I do in Leesburg, at, uh, Banshee Reeks, and then also Balls Bluff um, Regional Park. I, I really, really enjoy Balls Bluff. It's, it's a really beautiful area with a lot of native plants and a lot less invasive than some other areas. 
You can also join the garlic mustard cleanup that's going to start on March 3rd, and Amy's going to help out a week, a Thursday or so. Um, but that's enjoying it for six weeks on a Thursday. Pull some garlic mustard and watch the flowers grow. Yes, yes. That'll be great. <laughs> yeah. Donnie is ready for a walk. <laughs> okay, the the VNPS Puddle Mac, I don't know how to pronounce that chapter leaves wildflower walks in Arlington, Alexandria, and Fairfax. That's all again. Yeah, uh, if you're ever looking for more information on, um, well, I guess we're going to include a lot in the follow-up email, but there's uh, Virginia Master Naturalist chapters all over in almost every county in the area. Um, and they can help you find more resources or you can do um, things along with them or join them. Um, and then, you're welcome. Thanks for coming, everybody. This is a lot of fun to put on. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. You rock. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, um, we'll get the email out to you as soon as possible. Thanks for joining us. All right, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. <laughs>